hey, you want to make a million dollars? You need to be listening to Awaken Nation podcast with Brad Salos. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up, tired of the way things used to be. They are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors and the game changers, everyday people just like you and me from all over who are doing amazing Welcome things to Awakened Nation. Hey, everybody. I have a good friend on the show today, Achilles Larea. We met many years ago, many moons ago with uh, Bruce Lippin and uh, his group on Long Island in both Manhattan. Uh, and I'm just jazzed to have on have you on the show today, Achilles. Welcome to Awakened Nation, Brad. Thanks for having me again. A, a double pleasure. I, I can't say enough. I'm honored to be on again, and uh, hope we can help some people out. Absolutely. Uh, buckle up, my friends. Uh, get a pen and paper because Achilles uh, is going to go into all the investment strategies you, yes, you should be doing. Even if you're uh, 50 something years old, uh, it's never too late to invest. And since 54% of baby boomers did not save for retirement, this is going to be a fun show. You can do it. Uh, but I'm going to read your bio real quick. Uh, some of you may recognize Achilles, and we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, but um, Achilles is the founder and the CEO of Lorea Wealth Management and has done so for the past 20 years and counting. A well-known TV personality, Achilles Lorea Jr. has been advising successful individuals, executives, entrepreneurs, and their families to reach their goals and pursue the life they've always wanted but didn't know they could have. Achilles has been featured regularly, and you've probably seen him on uh, Mornings with Maria with the host Maria Bartiromo, uh, Coast to Coast with Neil Cavuto, and many, many others. You've seen him on uh, Fox Business, TD Ameritrade Network, Univision, The New York Times, CBS, CNBC, and many other media outlets for his investment expertise. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about his latest book today, Wise Up With Your Money. Uh, and I'm just, I'm excited to have you back on, my friend, because you've been doing a lot of great things. So officially, welcome to Awakened Nation. Thank you again for having me, Brad. Pleasure, as always. Sure. Now, I wanted to kick this off because there are several pathways to wealth. You know, one is... <laughs> You can start a business, struggle like hell for years, hope that it, you know, breaks through the million dollars a year category and grows. That's number one. Number two, you can buy a business or a franchise and create wealth from that. Um, and, and, you know, you can make a lot of money with that. Or you can inherit a lot of money. And then the fourth one that you're going to talk about today is you can invest wisely. So let's get started. Your new book, Wise Up. Uh, you know, it's. It, I was reading this and I was just so excited that you give a very bold statement in the beginning. You know, it takes commitment to this, it takes uh, a mindset. So let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, Brad, when we're talking about the mindset, uh, we're really alluding to the discipline that you need to have. And coming from a martial arts background in uh, Shotokan karate, Japanese karate, that is a perfect mindset to get yourself on the way. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to have it, but you just have to understand that that's a good beginning. And if you don't have that mindset, that's okay as well. It's just this never quit, keep going, and understand that you can get to the next level, but it's going to take time. It's not going to be overnight. It's something that you have to say to yourself almost every single day that this is what I want. This is what I want to have happen all the time. And it can never leave your mindset because your goals, your dreams, they don't go to sleep when you do. They show up in your dreams, they show up in your subconscious, and you just want to make sure you're simply following what they tell you to do. And it's not that hard if you allow them to. It's true. 
Uh, I love this quote you had in chapter three. Uh, chapter three is a great chapter, making a million dollars. But this quote is so powerful. When I was young, I thought that money was the most important thing in life. Now that I am old, I know it is. And that quote is from Oscar Wilde. Uh, why do you think in this day and age, because we have so many things at our fingertips, it's not like our grandparents' era where you had to go to an investment banker and or you had to go to somebody who was knowledgeable in this and get not only get investment advice, you would hand them a stack of cash. But in this day and age where we're hyper-connected, why are so many people hesitant to invest? I think, the fear of the unknown still prevails. And there's also this myth out there, Brad, that you can do it on your own. That is the biggest bunch of malarkey I have heard. And yeah. I'm taking this from an Irish background. I grew up yeah. in an Irish <laughs> neighborhood in Woodside, Queens, <laughs> New York. But that is the biggest bunch of malarkey I've ever heard. Because I want you to think your average advisor has thousands of hours beyond, you know, beyond the normal this is a love affair. You either love this business or you get out of it. Did you know, Brad, that yeah. 95 plus percent of advisors fail out in their first year? And of the ones that are left, that let's just say 5% of them fail out the second year and only 5% are making, well, actually it's closer to one to 2%, one to 2% make it past their fifth year. The fifth wow. year, I have been doing this for 30 years now. And let me tell you, it is something, it was a love affair that was born when I was 18. And I just, it just continued. You know, I, I, it, it's never stopped with me. My clients make me better at this. They always tell me, they keep me in check and they say, Hey, Achilles, make sure that you don't forget about us now that you're on TV and all that radio. You know, I just did two radio shows yesterday, but I spoke to two clients right after that. They keep me grounded. They keep me fresh. They keep me in the know, in the trenches. And I love that about them. So, you know, if you don't like people, Brad, you're going to be working on average with a person for 20, 25 years on minimum. I have clients longer than that. So if you don't like people, this is not the business for you. (laughs) But you can absolutely help your clients make a lot of money if they keep that discipline, if they keep that that mindset, the forthright with, I can make this money long term using all the factors. You know, I have a lot of business owners. I have a lot of uh, regular employee type clients who just have over the years have come to make more money than they thought ever possible because right. they save like squirrels. You know, they made this the right thing. They made it, uh, you know, we made it about them. We made that. They were going to do this, but they had to stay disciplined. They had to stay focused. And if not, they were going to have a lot of challenges and issues going forward. And I hate to say this, but most people, their discipline kind of checks out in the first six months. And then you got to remind them. You got to say, hey, come on back. Let's remember why we're doing this. And I remind them of their goals. I always have copious notes of what's going on, Brad. And I make sure, hey, this is what you told me you wanted. Is this still what you want? You're making me laugh in the beginning of your answer because I kept thinking to myself, how in the heck did you get started with this? You know, were you like that Warren Buffett type who started at six and you said, you know, I'm going to buy my first stock. Um, and you went out at Halloween as an investment banker, you know, just in the suit with a briefcase. <laughs> but, um, what was that transition? You said it was like 18. You decided this is what I want to do. Was it, it was it just, no. you said it was born of a passion, but what happened? Absolutely not. It was born out of passion, but when I was 18, uh, Boston Beer or Sam Adams went public. And I was working a job uh, and I saw in the paper or so, uh, some publication that they were going public. And I had saved up a little bit of money from my job and I went and I purchased it through a cardboard advertisement on one of the cases that my friend had brought over. <laughs> so I bought and I had an account with TD Ameritrade. I went and opened one up the minute I received the the shares of stock. Now, Brad, let me tell you, when I got the shares of stock, it traded on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. 
beautiful stock certificate that came in. I mean, these things are a work of art. If you've ever seen a real stock certificate, yeah. I mean, it's an amazing piece of art. And that was part of it. That was part of the allure. But more importantly to me at the time, well, you know, this is more than I've ever put any money towards. And I can't afford a house. I can't afford to do the big business things that I had in my head. So this was the one step I said, you know what, let me go and try this. Let me see how it worked out. And, you know, the stock went public, went up about $4. And uh, let's just say it was $20 at the time. And it went up to $24. I would call in. (laughs) Excuse me. I would call in to the TD Ameritrade hotline where they would give you (laughs) automated quotes, right? Automated. You know, and it would tell you. Boston beer is at 24 and one half, you know, and I would do that three or four times a day thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I I purchased this at $40 and I've already made $400. And at that time, Brad, that was more than half my week's paycheck. You know, we we are talking about a long time, but we are talking the nineties. So it was, you know, I don't think I was making more than uh, 20, 21,000 at the time, uh, yeah. you know, in, in a particular line of work. But that was it. That ignited the fire. That said to me, you know, this is great. I have a potential to make more money. And what happens? It went up, I believe, almost to $30, and I sold it right away. And the reason being is anytime, you know, I was reading, anytime you can get a better rate, uh, you know, than 10 to 12% on your money in less than a year, we call that a gift from God. I'm not an overly religious person, right. but let me tell you, when you make that kind of money on a, in a very short period of time, because I think there was less than two months, Brad, yeah. I did that and I said, wow, could you imagine if I could do that every single week? And there the mindset started forming. Now, it was years later, you know, it was uh, a, probably a good seven years later before I got into the business, six years later before I got into the business, uh, I was 24 at the time, and you know, a friend of mine suggested to me. He's like, "Hey, why don't you try this? You're really good with money." He, I was handling, I was running three karate schools at the time, uh, the money part, and also teaching. I was an international competitor. You, you know this story. Yep. And he said, "You should really try this." There's an open house for one of the financial houses. Dean Witter now, it's Morgan Stanley, and you should go and see if this is for you. Now, what had happened was that the South Africa, uh, not the South, yeah, um, the New Zealand team, I, I've fought South Africans, I've fought everybody, but uh, the New Zealand national team was coming in for a friendly tournament. <laughs> I love that word, friendly. Friendly. There's nothing friendly about it, Brad. Nothing friendly, <laughs> friendly at all in the martial arts, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So they were coming in to fight. My teacher, who was Japanese, suggested to me, uh, you, you know, I'd love you to be there. You get some good experience fighting these guys. And they came in and they did their haka dance right in the dojo. So, right. you know, they, you know, got, you got the head shaman guy. He's sticking his tongue out at you. By the way, after the dance, you know, after all the pleasantries are over and the tournament's over, he goes, when I stick out my tongue at you, ah, he goes like this. When I stick out my tongue at you, it means I want to eat you. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I never heard of this, something like that before, but it was very impressive. And it was all part of the story why I could not get there that night to that open house. My friend, you know, my best friend to the day, all of a sudden we're talking on the phone. He's like, I'm really disappointed in you, Achilles. I, you know, I, I, I think this is for you, and I think it would be an incredible addition to your life. So right. I said to him, hey, I'm going to call them up right now, and I'm going to get them the job. You watch me. Nine interviews later, I had the job. And the guy said to me, who's going to be my boss, he says to me, Achilles, I am hiring you not because of your college degree, not because your work experience, not because of any of that BS, he says to me. But because you are a karate guy, and if you can translate that to some of the tedium that is this business on a daily basis, you will do very well in this business. But remember, this takes time. It could take 
10 to 20 years. Right. So that was an incredible insight from him. I didn't understand it at the time. I was there thinking, Brad, I was going to do this in five years. I would do it in 10 years. But what I noticed was that the discipline of karate, the discipline of staying invested are very similar and allow you the freedom that you want in your life if you can just hang in there. But we are emotional creatures by nature. And this is why a financial advisor is so important. Think about it. When you're doing anything with a discipline, what's the first thing you want to do when it gets tough? Quit. Or you get emotional. The worst thing is you can get emotional about money. It's the worst possible thing. Right? Yeah, celebrate your success when it happens. But after that's done, remember, you still have a job to do. And that's to take care of yourself. And I remind my clients of that, you know, this is about you. This isn't about me. You know, at the end of the day, you are the ones who are going to be living the way that you are envisioning, that you wanted it to be. So that was just a little bit piece of that. I love listening to your stories because it is about this tenacity, this never give up attitude, this, uh, you know, go for it all. And you do get that in the martial arts. And for those of you who are listening or watching this interview, just think about your own life where, you know, I know everybody makes fun of this, you know, give up your $4 a day lattes. Uh, But it is that. Uh, You could save a lot of money, that extra money, uh, for those of you who aren't making, you know, $200,000 a year, you have to find that little bit of extra money today. And, uh, I, I, for years I put my, I made my coffee at home and put it in a thermos. Uh, and and if you have to do that, do that because you will know that you didn't invest when you hit about 50 something years of age, you'll start to go, Oh, because all your other friends are living differently than you. It is important to invest. Uh, yeah. And I love the fact that you've been doing this 20 years. Yeah. Don't be listening to guys who are only five years in the pit. Talk to somebody like Achilles. 30 years. Uh, I wanted to talk about this. And this was very, very interesting. I was watching an episode of Dave Ramsey's show where he talks about investing. And his sidekick, uh, somebody had called in this couple and the wife was talking about how they, they only put $150 away uh, or $150 into their, their 401k or retirement vehicle. Uh, once a month, they put $150. That's it. And Dave Ramsey was like, well, well, how much do you make a year? Well, combined salary, they were making like 300 grand. And so they're sitting there going, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? Well, they both had car loans. And one of the car loans, you know, along with uh, insurance was like 750 a month. And then the other car loan they had was she was paying 550 a month. I think it was plus insurance. And so right out the door, there's 1500 to two grand, including if you include gas and everything else uh, in their investing, you know, because they were, they were living high off the hog. And the first thing Dave said is you got to get rid of one of those cars. (laughs) Do you find that some people, once they start making big money, they forget the investment part and start buying the toys and the house and all this other stuff that they really don't need because they think they deserve to level up? No, no, absolutely not. I find the exact opposite. The Mm -hmm. prototypical, if you look at Thomas Stanley's Millionaire Next Door, those are the type of people I run into on a regular basis. And in his book, Thomas Stanley just alluded to the fact that These people never wear a watch more than $70. They have Timexes, you know, and we are talking uh, quite a few years ago, but the the mode or the mentality hasn't changed, Brad. What's important at this point, you know, in the case of that particular couple was that it's, there's a principle called Pareto's principle that when a certain, you make a certain amount of money and you make, you know, let's just say it goes up hundred thousand dollars more you take on that hundred thousand dollars whether it be debt whether it be expenses and the like and you feel like you're on the you're the hamster on the wheel and you just keep going and going and there's no end to it right. what i have found with the millionaire next door is is the exact opposite they want to retain 
that blue collar background, that blue collar status. They are embarrassed to tell anybody what they have. They would never call into a show unless they're showing off to say right. we have this, this, and this. No, that would embarrass them. What I have run right. into are people who save like squirrels. Take that couple, couple for instance. That same couple, if they were following Tom Stanley's uh, book and advice, they would have been putting anywhere between thirty to sixty thousand dollars away a year. Now that's only ten to twenty percent, Brad. If you think about it, it's yeah. really, you know, not a huge amount it's an amount that is affordable in their word world because if you think about it right now i guarantee where the expense went aside from those cars is the daily they're out eating every single day you know uh you talked about the coffee example the coffee example will not make you rich all right right there's a big fallacy and i see young guys talking about it's not the fact that it's going to make you rich it's that once you have started doing that and putting that money away you will grow that money exponentially through the power of compounding so just taking that into consideration along with the other little tidbits the nooks and crannies that you get at when you start saving like a squirrel you know i was looking today i saw a documentary there was a, a woodpecker and he's putting nuts into the tree you know a lot of people don't realize why a woodpecker digs into the tree they put nuts in there for the winter and when the winter comes they go and they grab the nuts and they eat them you're retiring you need to think of that like you're retiring if you think about it right so you're going the retirement has come and by the way retirement shouldn't be the end event for you right. it should simply be hey i've reached an age where i don't need to kill myself like i used to if i was an entrepreneur or an employee i don't need to even be full-time anymore you know right. or i am done i have reached a point where i am fed up with this particular lifestyle i have saved enough to get me to the next level lifestyle and right. i'm going to take advantage of that fact and have more time with my loved ones my uh people who i cherish my passion places no it could be golf it could be hanging out it could be hey i'm gonna go get a beer today or something like that right. you know brad i'll tell you i have a passion i like going uh, you and i are, are both musicians this is why we have so much in common right tonight i'm going out and i'm gonna go to an open mic and sing I've been doing it for over a year now. I've been singing for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, in addition to playing the drums for over 30 plus years, but, right. you know, the singing I've been doing for the last uh, three years now and singing in front of an audience that I have never met in my life is exciting, exhilarating. And every once in a while I do okay. And people say, hey, thanks, you know, for, for doing those songs because we don't do songs that everybody does you know so right. it's it's just an excitement i hope your retirement lifestyle is just like that that you're able to pursue those passions to make your life exciting for you and your spouse go on that trip go do what the, what you had envisioned when you were in your 20s and now that you have the resources to why aren't you doing it what are you waiting for you know it's kind of like when you go to those buffet places you know and you don't want everybody to know you're eating a certain amount of you know things so you grab a little bit but you end up coming back six times you right know, it's crazy no grab it pile it on you know just do it right away retirement should be smart like you were when you were younger but carry the discipline into your retirement and let yourself let go every once in a while because it's important if not you will make big mistakes with your money wow you said a mouthful my friend that is <laughs> phenomenal one of my favorite quotes is from les brown the the motivational speaker les brown and he said the easiest thing i ever did was make a million dollars. And he stood on stage and he added up everybody in the stadium that he was speaking in and how much they had spent. And then he said, you know, I get 50% of the door, blah, blah, blah. 
And so you, you added it up and he made way more than a million dollars that day. And then he ended that, that whole thing with, and he looked right at everybody, he looks around the arena and he goes, the hardest thing I ever had to do though, was believe I could make a million dollars. And I think that's incredibly powerful in this day and age because there are people who have that discipline, but they don't really maybe see themselves as becoming a millionaire. Like you said, some of them are even embarrassed that they have this kind of money and would never want to flaunt it or talk about it. I grew up around farmers, uh, you know, who, who basically, they didn't talk about their money. Uh, I myself took a company public and I lived really, really simply because you know, why do I need a seven layer cake? You know, what does real do? You know, I'm fine with a, with a three bedroom house. Two of those are, are uh, one is a studio for me and one is a, a studio for, for my fiance. So um, I have to ask you, uh, your clients come to you already, you know, with that mindset, but what do you do with a client that comes to you that you know, maybe doesn't have that mindset. Do you massage that a little bit and help them, you know, transition to, Hey, you can do this. You know, to paraphrase a movie and not go into the cultural things, but every investor wants to be an, a millionaire. Mm -hmm. They just don't know it yet. Right. So I'm the guy they come, you know, it's actually the opposite, Brad. Most people come to me. They don't have that mindset. They have they have the millionaire next door mindset, but when it comes to investing, someone has told them that they can get rich quick. Someone has told them that they can do it themselves. Someone has said to them that this is easy. To which I, as you said, I massage a little bit, and I cajole them, and I tell them it's not. That's why you need me. Because if you didn't, I wouldn't have a job. You know, AI was supposed to take me out 30 years ago. I was <laughs> being told AI, you know, artificial intelligence, you're going to be knocking, you know, on the doors looking for a new job soon. You know? And I can not tell you, you know, I can tell you just from experience, I've never been in more demand now than I have now. Yeah. So, and that's really because I speak very plain. I don't believe yeah. in gobbly cook jargonese. Right? If someone wanted to go learn a language, they would go grab a Rosetta Stone and or one of those Babel apps and you do that. When they come to me, I will accept them as a client when they have said to me, I need your help. Yeah. I am open to what you're telling. I need your help says to me that you are open to the possibilities that you are not going to go in a different direction that we are on the same page the question becomes is it reality that you're looking at for your future or is it a fantasy that you've conjured up and right. i've run into a few situations where it was a fantasy and those mm -hmm. people don't last the reason right. being is that they have created this multiverse to, you know to quote marvel this multiverse in their minds where they're someone who they're absolutely not they're not that person and right. they think they are and it never changes it doesn't matter if they started with me when they were trying you know I, I have people whose kids were not born when i started the practice and now they're graduating from college you know right. let me tell you it is one of the most amazing things to say to a client i am so proud of you that you put all this money away to help them get through college, you're going to probably end up buying them a house, you know, with what you've done and you've been smart, you've been strategic. And I was just happy to be a part of it. And that gives me pride beyond the belief, Brad. I agree with you on that one. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that because you do talk about that in uh, the book, you know, the ability to give back, the, the ability to help people. But you keep referencing this book. And I read this years ago. I loved this book, The Millionaire Next Door, The Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy by Thomas Stanley uh, and um, William Danko as well. He's a co-author. Uh I just found that book fascinating because we all have the myth, as you said, the illusion in our head of what a millionaire looks like. 
And I don't have that illusion simply because I grew up around farmers who had $4 million in, in the bank in cash. So, you know, you, you, you meet a pig farmer and you have an attitude that, oh, who is this guy? Meanwhile, they're also driving around in a 1958 Ford pickup truck still. And this is hard for you, I would imagine, to break that myth inside people's head. You just talked about it a little bit, but um, let's shift gears to the next generation and their belief in wealth. What do you find very different between, let's say, the baby boomer mindset and the millennial mindset? Yeah, uh, and I can't take my generation. Let's actually go beyond. Let's take Gen Z. Okay. Uh, you know, so uh, I was born in 69, you know, so I'm 54 years old. Uh, Gen X is my generation. You know, we have, we're kind of the go between, uh, between these generations. Yes. What yeah, I see it. with the younger, yeah, what, what I see with the younger generation, uh, it's not that they are not disciplined. As a matter of fact, they are just as disciplined. But what they're not going to do is they're not going to wait around for this to happen. And this is exactly the opposite that needs to occur when you're investing. I've seen right. it with real estate. I see, you know, uh, I'm very, pretty well rounded when it comes to the different disciplines of money. And what I see works and what I see doesn't work is many different things. So what I see in the younger generation is that they want to do it yesterday. But <laughs> It takes time. I mean, Brad, when you were building your company, you didn't build that company overnight to go public. You know, no. you were thinking, hey, I'm just going to get to this point. And then you got to that point and someone approached you and said, hey, let's take you public. Let's see if we can do this even bigger and better than what you started. Yeah. But it wasn't your original attention, right? No, I didn't even know what an IPO was. I mean, I, I like I said, I'm from a small town. My CEO educated us. And we had session after session for six months before we went public with Arthur Anderson to train me on how to speak to the market, speak to Main Street and Wall Street, how to look at a business opportunity. I mean, that took, I know I had a crash course in six months, but some people it's a lifetime of learning. You know, there was an interesting uh, quote from Charlie Munger, who recently passed away from the uh, him and Warren Buffett founded Berkshire Hathaway, and he was basically the second in command. He goes, the first 100,000 is the easiest to make. So it was similar to Les Brown was saying, first 100,000 is the easiest. He goes, then getting to the million. I, I'm sorry, let me go back. The first 100,000 is the hardest to make, but everything after that snowballs, and then you become much more wealthy in a short, shorter time span. What the, this next generation, the subsequent generations need to remember is to get to that point, whether it be 100,000, whether it be now 250,000, whatever that point needs to be. Once you get to a fixed point where you have said, okay, I wouldn't mind having that, but what would my life look like if I got to the half million? And then reset, reset the mind, reset your goals, what would it look like at the million? Because a million dollars right. isn't a lot anymore, you know, in some people's minds. So you need to mind mindset your way to what if I had 10 million, you know, and that's really, you know, the point for the most aggressive people I see out there in terms of saving like crazy, investing like crazy and doing whatever it takes to get to that point. Not everybody has that mindset, Brad. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. As a matter of fact, in terms of entrepreneurs, only 10% or less ever reach that high, those high goals. Right. But there are some people who replace their job with a business. It's just a higher paying job and the financial freedom and the freedom uh, from corp corporations and the like who are perfectly happy with the million dollars we're perfectly happy with 500 grand and right. what the younger generation is going to realize is they're going to get to a point where how much is enough how much do i really need and once i've reached that point 
what is my quality of life? I've known people who were making 20 million, 20 million a year. They were bloody miserable. I mean, they were just <laughs> unbelievably miserable. I knew this guy who was drop shipping, doing you know, a whole bunch of things with Amazon, and he hated it. So he ended up settle, selling the business, ended up going into something completely different, and now he's enjoying life. He works part time, yeah, but he doesn't have to. You know, he, he made a lot of money from selling the business. I think he got two times earnings. So, you know, he took that, didn't really live a ridiculous lifestyle and is now enjoying life traveling around and seeing what life really is about. And I think that's important. I think this is just leading up to taking the money you have, living a simpler life, and uh, really planning for financial freedom, or at least some breathing room for some people. And you're never too late to start. Um, what are the top five things that you suggest to not only your clients, but the people listening on, on this show? What do you re recommend that they do to get started and make this a sustainable part of their daily lives, almost like a unconscious competency. Yeah, absolutely. If you can, first thing is to come up with a plan with yourself, your spouse, and a financial person. Now, I'm not talking about who someone started in the business yesterday. To the bare minimum time, you want to be working with someone. They got to have 10 years in the business. They have seen three to five bad markets by that point, all right? right? We call them market cycles. They occur every five years, all right? But in 10 years, you can, there's, there's bound to be a bad point in the market. And right. you didn't get emotional. So, you know, that's one thing. Second thing, every savings that you're planning on putting away must have purpose to serve you. The Richest Man in Babylon is a book that tells you about, I'm going to, make that money my slave and it's going to work for me every single day it's unemotional so even before you do that make that money your slave put that money into something that is going to give you interest give you a return on investment give you equity uh you know so that's number two number three working with an advisor that's competent but working with someone who understands your goals and dreams, all right? Number four, make sure that you keep the discipline. The discipline is very simple if you understand it, but it gets really difficult when the bad times come. Inevitably, you will have bad times. Yes. You need someone there in your corner like a good advisor or a good friend to say, hey, this ain't going to last forever. So hang in there because you're going to get past this. It, that old saying, it, soon, it too will soon pass. Can't, you can't say it any better than that. Right. And the last thing is once you've reached the mark that you have been longing to achieve and really just able to take a little bit of a breather, enjoy it because you you know there are a lot of people who they work 30 30 years at a company 50 years at a company you know one of the saddest experiences i had as an advisor was i had a client who worked with this big telecommunications company and she decided to finally retire and she asked for my help we're helping her out i don't even think it was six weeks afterward she died she wow. passed away. She was working like a dog for that company, and that company didn't appreciate her at all. But that's just the way it happened. I think that's one of the saddest things could, that can happen. She did not have family, unfortunately. Brad, do you know where the money went to? What? What? The pension plan went back to the, to the, the company pension because there's a provision in there for that. It, it, she died without a will. So New York State is probably going to be the biggest beneficiary of that because no one is there to contest the will. It is the saddest thing I've seen. She had quite a bit of money 
you know, but what I thought was just even worse was that, you know, during that time, it was almost a month before they found it. Wow. It's terrible. It's terrible. Do not let your life go by. Be of the mindset that as important as it is to make that money, it's just as important to start living even before you retire. Make sure you get some things accomplished that you wanted to. Take that big yes. trip once, once every few years. Do, buy that car if it's if your yeah. money is available. Make sure you go buy that car, even if it's just once. It doesn't matter. You can give that car back next next year. You could sell it. it doesn't matter. But the fact is, is that you did it. Or even more importantly, spend the time with your loved ones, because yeah. that. Is experience, you know, Starbucks, uh, even in this day and age, still has lines going out the door. Yes. Do you know when I go to the Starbucks, they know exactly how my I, I want my coffee. I, I order it through the app, but the people there know that I like it a certain way, you know, and it's done almost the same way every single time. That's why there's a line out of the door in most Starbucks. I would whether I'm here. Or whether I, I was just in Miami, they made it the same way. And I'm not just, you know, quoting one company. There are a lot of successful companies that have repeatable, memorable experiences. If you can create that repeatable, memorable experience for yourself, you will create unbelievable happiness in your life. And I really hope you do. What you're really talking about is being a CEO of your own life. Uh, you know, you, you, if you're hearing this or watching or reading this, you really have to get it together as an adult. You need to have a will. You need to ask yourself, why am I working? Is it to pay bills? Uh, if a company doesn't appreciate you, get out of there, go to a place that does appreciate you and have a little fun with your money. Like I said, why are you working? You know, why are you working? Are you working just to pay bills? Or do you want to sit back one day and live in a nice home? Uh, or do you want to buy a series of buildings maybe? Or, you know, maybe you just want to go on that dream vacation where for three months you go all over Europe. Think about it. You know, think about what is what is your dream? Um, write down your practical dreams, but also write down the pie in the sky Maybe this would happen. I would love it and uh, go for it and uh, reach out to Achilles because uh, he's someone you can trust when it comes to advising. I do have a really powerful question that I think everybody wants to know. And that is, how do you know you've hired a bad investment advisor? It's real simple. You don't get along with them. All right. I tell people right at the front, I go, we have to get along and like each other. And it's two, it's a two-way street. I will fire you as a client if I don't like you, or you have uh, you know, things that you say to me that are not congruent to what I believe in. Our belief right. systems have to be somewhat aligned. So at you as a client, you have to say to yourself, can I picture myself with this guy for the next 30 years? Because right. we're going to be together a long time. You know, and you have to say to yourself, another thing is, is he really doing what's in my best interest? You know, as a fiduciary, you have to do what's in the client's best interest. You know, I, I was a fiduciary way, way before anybody was calling it what it is today. And I want to say probably a good 10 years before that word even came to, into vogue. But it's just a fancy way of saying, hey, are we on the same page? You right. know, but your your dreams, your goals are first. Right. I'm gonna get to wherever I'm gonna get when the time is right. But you are my priority. Right. You are the person who makes all this possible. My clients challenge me to be better. My clients want me to get them to a certain point, but then to have ideas that are outside of the box that they haven't thought about. And that's part of what I do as well. You know, seeing what might be an issue before it becomes an issue. 
right? Mm-hmm. If your advisor can't do that or give you ideas that don't sound like everybody else, then keep looking. I wouldn't say to go and interview three guys. No, you probably have to interview one person to know what you like and what you don't. Right. The second person that you talk to, though, even before you have that sit down, you should ask some questions. But be careful. Because right now, we are now in a world where there aren't as many qualified advisors as there are, as there should be, because the big corporations want you to either work on a team or they want you to uh, do things that are in their best interest. Brad, you right. can't, I think I've said this before on your show, you cannot serve two masters, yes. right? As far as I'm concerned, your client is the number one priority. And if you forget that as an advisor, it comes through when you talk to them. It comes through. If you don't believe it, you're kidding yourself as an advisor. As a client, you can see right through advisors who are only looking out for themselves. You know, you go to the bank for arguments like, and I don't want to disparage large institutions, but you know, you go to one place and they all they have is one investment for you or two investments. Why? Yeah. Because it's in their best interest. Because it's not risky. Because it's not in their best interest to be a fiduciary, per se. So what do they do? They recommend things that sound somewhat safe, but are not in your best interest. Right. So going back to your question, talk to a few people but even before you talk to them have an idea of what the perfect relationship would look like and then ratchet it down a little bit from there because you should be able to have a good conversation you know i mean i i know when i have a cl- a good client and they know when they have a good advisor you know one person said to me right off the bat you don't say what i want to hear you say the things that are real and sometimes I may not agree with you. And sometimes it pisses me off that we did this. And sometimes it's not a perfect world, but I'd rather have that person telling me the real deal versus someone who just tells me what I want to hear, kisses my butt, you know, do, does all the things that he or she thinks that is the right way. You know, and those people are a dime a dozen. People who worked with me over the years know what the difference is. Wise up with your money with Achilles Larea. Thank you, my friend, for being on Awakened Nation. I really appreciate this, Achilles. Thank you, Brad. Always a pleasure and always an honor. I have one last question for you before I let you go. No! (laughs) You You talk in the book about how Money can make you happy. Let's talk about that. You know, money can make you happy to a certain point. I I, I believe I said that just as an attention grabber, you know, but money gives you the freedom of choice. The choice of whether you're going to go out and enjoy life on your terms or if you're going to be a slave to just keeping making money and it wasn't in your best interest and it gets boring or if it it could get frustrating and the like. So money can make you happy in a sense, but it cannot, you have to remember it's a tool and you must use it wisely. Wise up with that money, Brad, wise up. (laughs) Achilles, thank you so much. Uh, it's, this book is extraordinary and I recommend everybody go out and get a copy of it. Uh, it's on Amazon. Am I correct? Uh, and do we go to your it's, website? It's going to be Amazon, uh, Barnes and Nobles, Apple books, you name it. It's going to be out there. Uh, we are the anti-establishment when it comes to the information we share with people, because a lot of companies just don't know, you know, mm-hmm. or they don't want to tell you. Hey, I'm going to tell you like it is, whether you're going to make a million dollars or not. And it really depends on you. It's not on anybody else. But I can help you get there, and good people can help you get there. 
Reach out to Achilles, my friends. Go to LareaWealth.com. Is that correct? That's right. Go to LareaWealth.com and uh, get to know, get to create a relationship with Achilles because uh, he's not only a good friend of mine, but he cares. He really pushes hard for his clients and um, the most honest guy in the world, man. He'll tell you, don't invest in that. <laughs> we also have a podcast out coming. It's going to be called Wise Up Podcast uh, coming out soon. And we're also, uh, in addition to the book, we are going to have probably a wiseupshow.com uh, for to purchase the book through there. Excellent. Good. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you, Achilles, for being on Awakened Nation, my friend. Thank you, Brad. A pleasure as always. Can't wait to come back for the next book. Absolutely. Hey, everybody, don't forget to tune in each week on a Tuesday is when we launch the show. Uh, and until then, bye-bye for now. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.